Episode 2. The notion was comforting, but I was still tormented by grief. The hole where he'd been in my life was enormous. I danced around it in agony. Brooke, who lived in New Jersey, had to return home. Two weeks after his death, Brooke invited me to visit her in her little cottage near a stand of woods. She was still struggling with our loss, and I suspected that my being there might give us both some solace. Being April, tiny flowers were poking their heads out of the ground all around her house, and we talked about how Dean would have loved her place. He liked the woods. He loved plants. She planned on asking him to recuperate at her house when he felt like traveling. I tried to function, tried for her sake to smile, but nights in the guest bed, I cried myself to sleep. One night was especially difficult. The tears wouldn't stop, and the pain was as close to unbearable as, as anyone could imagine. And I gasped out loud, Oh, darling, if only I knew where you were. My whole concept of heaven's been blown out of the water. You can't carry a tune, so I know you aren't up there singing the hallelujah chorus, and you darn well aren't flapping around strumming a harp. Where are you? Where? Moonlight filtered across the room through lace curtains at the windows. I was aware of how pretty Brooke had made the place, aware of the moonlight, aware of everything. Yet, I lay there tormented by the feeling of not knowing. If only I could envision where he was. Was he as dust in the ground? Was he no more than the ashes we sprinkled from a friend's plane over the beach Dean loved so much? Was that all of him? At the zenith of such pain, when I didn't see how I could live through it, I felt a rush of air on my face that made me literally gasp for breath. The wind stung my eyes, so I closed them. And when I did, I had the sensation of flying. I could actually see landscape beneath me. Just scarcely clearing treetops, I raced along, stretched out with my arms in front of me like Superman. In an instant, I cleared the trees, and then I was zooming over hills, and then the desert, and then <gasps> I was in space. There was nothing around me but silence. I was still going fast, but with nothing to gauge speed against, I, I don't know if I was going as fast as I'd been going. What I do know is that wind ceased raking my hair back from my face and I could breathe naturally again. When I came to a stop, I was on the most incredible surface. It looked like a moonscape. I remember clearly that a huge boulder was to my left, and it rose maybe 20, 30 feet from the ground, and, and it was covered in rock. As far as I could see, all the way to the horizon, there was nothing but flat, broken rocks. The sky was filled with darkness, vast darkness. Not frightening darkness, but a caressing darkness, velvety. Like the moon rising over desert landscape, a beautiful blue planet was emerging. Only about one half, the top half, was visible. Everything around me was covered in a magnificent silver-blue sheen, I realized that Dean was standing to my right, but a bit behind me so that he was out of my sight. And I said out loud, Oh, honey, this is incredible. But where in the world are we? A nagging little thought crept into my mind. Dear God, don't tell me this is where he lives, here all by himself. It was beautiful, but it was desolate. There was no sound and no movement, just tranquility and absolute silence. Dean said in that deep, wonderful voice I love so much, this is where I come when I want to be alone and think. I nodded toward the moon rising on the horizon. What's that? His voice had a hint of humor in it. That's Earth, Mom. That's when my eyes flew open. My heart was hammering. I hadn't been asleep. I'd been talking to Dean and crying when the whole thing started. I'd felt the wind in my face. I heard his voice. I had been there with him. I squeezed my eyes shut, and, and I hung on to my sanity as best I could. Oh, darling, I whispered into the moonlit room. Thank you, thank you. At that moment, I felt a distinct kiss on my right cheek. 
It was soft, yet firm, and slightly damp. It lasted only a moment, and then it was gone. Dean was gone. I'd been with him. He was all right. On the plane going back to California, I thought back to something that had happened just the Christmas before at my mother-in-law's home. Dean had never visited his stepdad at Larry's mom before. <laughs> Reva was pushing 90, but my goodness, she could flat wear me out. I think she'd best be described as a realistic, conservative, dynamic dynamo. She still worked every day as executive secretary for her church, and she still drove her car, still handled all of the church investments, or at least prepared them for their CPA. She still cooked for the family and friends on holidays, and she still ruled her, her roost with a will of iron. Dean knew her from her few trips to see us out in Seal Beach, but this year we were going to rendezvous at her place in Miami. Well, Larry and I settled into the largest of her five, five bedrooms that's up on the second floor. And Dean, he chose a smaller one next to ours. That first night we turned in pretty early. We were so tired from our trip and from hours of visiting with those dropping by to see Reba's kids. <laughs> they wanted to see the kids who worked at a big Hollywood studio. Well, our first morning there, Larry, Larry did what he always did, whether, whether we were at Reva's house or she at ours. He got up at dawn to have coffee and read aloud with her from um, the Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. And it was a ritual that had begun when, when he was a child and never varied when they were together. Well, somewhere around seven or so, there was a soft tap at the bedroom door, and I called, It's unlocked. And Dean stuck his head into the room. Morning, I said, patting a spot next to me on the side of the bed. And Dean sat down. He was, he was looking unusually grave. What's the matter, I asked him. And he shook his head slowly. I, I don't know how to say it. Well, what's wrong, hon? Well, it isn't really wrong, Mom. It's, well, okay. Here's what happened. And he took a second to collect his thoughts. I was getting ready to get under the covers last night when it felt like somebody was watching me. You know that feeling, you know. But the Venetian blinds were shut, and so was my door. So I knew there was nobody around. Anyway, I turned off the light, and I got in bed, and that's when I saw a little boy, and he was at the foot of the bed. What? <laughs> I think I squeaked just a bit. Well, he was just standing there, Mom, staring at me, and it struck me that he looked so solemn, like, like the loneliest kid in the world. And what are you saying, Dean, that you saw a ghost? Dean shook his head. Well, he looked solid enough, but yeah, I mean, it had to be. Were you afraid? No, no. I was worried about him because he looked so unhappy. So what'd you do? Well, finally, I said hello to him. And what'd he do? Well, he said, can you play catch with me? And I told him it was dark outside and that I needed to go to sleep and that I couldn't play with him. And he just kept staring at me with those huge, sad eyes. And then I asked him if he had a name. And he sort of whispered, John. And I asked how old he was, but I'm not sure I heard him right. I think he said he was nine. But he was awfully small for a nine, Mom. Anyway, he asked me again if I would play catch with him, and I said again that it was late and, and that we couldn't play ball. And then what happened, Dean? Well, then he disappeared. 
and I lay back on my pillow. Gosh, for heaven's sake. Well, what do you make of it, Mom? I don't know, honey. I reached for his hand, and then we looked at each other, trying to puzzle it out when, of course, you know, there was no answer. Well, a few minutes later, Dean and I joined Reva and Larry in the kitchen. Dean sat at the table across from my husband while my mother-in-law hustled around. I think she was preparing pancakes and I don't remember what else. Anyway, I was pouring myself a cup of coffee at the counter when I said, Do you think a child named John ever lived in this house, Reva? Well, she whipped around to me, her mouth set in a straight and disapproving line and a scowl on her face. I could see that she was offended or, or angry, but I couldn't imagine what triggered such a reaction. So I glanced at Larry, who was subtly shaking his head, you know, a signal to shut up and sit down, which I did. And, and not another word was said about it, and so we all ate our breakfast in sort of a somber silence. When I was alone with Larry, though, I asked him what happened. He was reluctant to answer, though he finally did. And he said, I had a brother. He died before I was born, and his name was John. Moms never talked about him. I didn't even know about him until a few years ago. Oh, that poor, poor child, I kept thinking. Little John, still waiting to be acknowledged, still waiting for someone to show they cared. It, my heart broke for him. And when I shared the story with Dean, he said he wished he had encouraged the kid to stay and talk. He really hoped that John would reappear, you know, during the course of our three-day stay, but but he never did. How did that prepare me for what would happen a year later when Dean came back to take me to a place where he could be alone and think? I'm not sure. But it seems possible the incident at Reva's house sort of set the foundation for Dean and for me to be comfortable with the idea of life after death. I don't think we'd ever talked about it before, but we each accepted the sad little boy Dean met in the guest room as real. And maybe that's why it was easy for Dean to reach me a year later from the other side, because we had both opened our mind and our heart to the reality of spirit eternal. My return from Brooks Place in New Jersey to Seal Beach, California, met a brief plane trip with a long layover. It gave me plenty of time for uninterrupted thinking. And there was much to think about. Everything sort of took on a surreal feeling. And yet I had to acknowledge that the realization of life as a continuing journey made me come to grips with the fact that we spend most of our time worrying about and dealing with that which has no reality. If we are all we take with us when we go, are we not better off spending a lifetime developing our spiritual self? If that's all that endures, it's the only thing that makes sense. Spirit is all that's durable. That which we cannot see is all that's real. I mulled all this over as I sipped jasmine tea in an airport restaurant. I went back in my mind to things that happened recently, things that, again, may have been God preparing me mentally, emotionally, and spiritually for what lay ahead. It wasn't so long ago that I'd gone to see Dean in Fresno. It was a short hop if I took the plane out of the John Wayne Airport in Orange County, less than an hour. 
So I flew up one morning and came back that evening, giving me a five-hour visit with my son in between. We'd gone out to buy drapes for his living room. When we got back to his place, we kicked off our shoes and sprawled out in the living room, and I can't, I can't remember what we talked about, but somewhere in the conversation, Dean said something about Todd. Todd, I repeated, my head cocked to one side like a curious beagle. Now oh, my brother Todd. What do you know about Todd? Todd was my son who had died a year before Dean was born, crib death. He was only three months old. I once told Dean that all during my pregnancy with him, I was convinced that Todd was coming back. I spoke freely of how I adored Todd, even before he was born. Fortunately, I felt the same way about Dean, though I kept calling him Todd for the longest time. I wasn't sure Dean paid much attention one way or another. He'd never commented on it before. So it was a surprise to hear that he'd been talking to his older brother. Dean shrugged as if to say it was no big deal. I've always talked to him. I sat up straight on the sofa to look at my amazing son. Did you ever see him? No, I never did. Not until the other morning. You saw him? Ah, I was shaving. I was telling him what was going on at work. And then I saw him in the mirror standing behind me just over my shoulder. But seeing my surprised reaction, he chuckled. He's been coming around a lot ever since. So many things swirled in my brain. What do you look like? Uh, me. Well, a lot like me. Blonde. I tried to imagine Todd at Dean's age. You ever see him, he asked. No, I've never seen anybody who's died. Well, that was before Aunt Betty told me about Grandpa. And now, at the airport, sipping tea, my thoughts went back to that afternoon. To Dean saying that Todd had been coming around a lot lately. When was I at Dean's house? I, I tried to remember the date. I was there in February, or was it early March? Was Todd preparing the way for Dean? Letting him know without saying it that life is eternal? Dean had had two encounters with spirit, John and Todd. He didn't question their validity, and neither did I. A few days after I got back from New Jersey, I received in the mail a package wrapped in plain brown paper. It looked like a book. It was addressed to me, but there was no return on it, nor was there a cancel stamp to indicate where it had come from. Inside, I found it really was a book, The Complete Angel. The image of a male angel on the cover looked so much like Dean, it could have been an actual photograph of him. During Dean's March visit, he'd sat at my computer to write something for the newsletter he edited for the airline that employed him. I grabbed up my camera and snapped a shot of him glancing over his shoulder at me. Now, with the angel book in my hand, I raced to my office to find that photo. I held it next to the book. The image of the angel and the picture of Dean were nearly identical. The angle of the head, the expression on his face, everything. I asked Larry when he got home if he'd ordered the book, and he hadn't. I still have it, and to this day, I have no idea where it came from. The days stretched out in front of me. They came and they went, one at an agonizing time. I breathed in and I breathed out. I walked forward and I stepped to the side. I lay down, I got up, I ate, I slept, some. Life had no color, no purpose. The gaping hole of loneliness and pain roared for me to leap inside and pull the ground in over me. Dean. Gone. Forget the silent midnight planet where he went to be alone. Forget the damp, reassuring kiss on my cheek in Brooke's guest room. He was gone, and life would never be the same. Life would never be, period. I still knew that God was with me. I still knew that Dean was fine. But I was not. When Dean's insurance company informed me that I was the beneficiary of a small inheritance, I buckled. I don't want his insurance money, I wanted to scream. I want him. I collapsed into the rocking chair in my office and sobbed until I wrung myself dry. Then I again noticed the box of Dean's writing under my desk. In that instant, I felt I heard him say, That's it, Mom. 
Go out and help aspiring screenwriters. <laughs> help them how? I said the words aloud, thinking that a drawer filled with rejection slips wouldn't be of a lot of value to many folks. But the voice, not his, but my own voice, yet from Dean, continued. Tell them what you learned at MGM. You pitch stories and you were pitched too. You saw how deals were made, how it's done from the inside. Tell them how it really is, Mom. I sat there thinking about it for a few minutes. Then I got up and went to the phone where I dialed the number of my ex-boss, a producer on the TV series Chips, when I was production coordinator. Don Gold had gone on to produce Miami Vice for seven years and was now producer of the popular Dick Van Dyke series Diagnosis Murder. When Donald answered, I said without preamble, I know what I'm going to do with Dean's insurance money. I'm going to go across country helping aspiring screenwriters. I'm going to do for them what I wish I'd done for him. Want to go? He didn't miss a beat. Sure, when do we start? <laughs> with the blessing of his wife, Joella, and my husband, Larry, we took our first leap into the world of screenwriting workshops in October of 1994. I decided that we would have our little out-of-town tryout in Kansas City, Missouri. If all went well, we wouldn't make too big a fools of ourselves, and we might actually be of some assistance to somebody along the way. What I'd forgotten in the rush to honor Dean's memory was that I'm terrified of speaking in front of crowds, even tiny crowds. When I'd go to some function where we sat in a circle and the ringmaster or whomever was conducting whatever it was I was attending ask us to introduce ourselves and tell a little bit about what we did, my mouth would go cotton ball dry, my palms would sweat, my heart thundered. Worst of all, my chest would become so constricted that when I spoke I sounded like Minnie Mouse on helium. Nevertheless, I'd made a commitment. I'd go wherever I could help make somebody's writing dream come true. Later, after I'd written a screenwriting textbook and workshop students asked me to sign it, I dropped the word dream and wrote on the flyleaf, May all your goals come true. I came to realize that a goal is a dream put to action. As I told one young lady who questioned me on it, I'm not much interested in taking my time to work with somebody who wants to sit under a tree and dream about becoming a screenwriter. But I'll bust my buns to help anyone who makes that their goal and who's willing to work for it. I made arrangements to rent a mansion near the University of Missouri for the weekend. Then I hired a catering service to bring in individual picnic baskets filled with healthful sandwiches and fruit. Nothing plastic or artificial was allowed. The lunches, served by two women venturing into their own catering business, were outstanding. The baskets a hit. I felt that if Donald and I were there to nurture creativity, our setting had to be as creative as we could make it. No hotel banquet rooms for us. Nothing sterile or mundane would be tolerated. That first workshop was like trying out for Olympic gold. How was I ever going to get my mouth open and my voice working? My stomach lurched. As our first students took their seats, my heart nearly thumped its way out of my bosom. I excused myself and ran to the restroom, where I dashed into a stall. I leaned against the closed door, pulling in deep, calming breaths. God, I whispered aloud, let me get out of my way. Let me forget about me and remember that I'm here to honor Dean and to help whoever needs our help. Let your words come out of my mouth. Let me say whatever it is you would have me say. Thank you. Amen. I walked out of that restroom with quiet confidence. I marched myself to the front of the room, took in a lung full of air, and I began. Hi, I'm Esther. I understand you want to be a screenwriter, and I have to tell you that's probably the worst idea you've ever had. But if you're determined, then let us at least educate you to the reality of Hollywood. But be warned. You're in for one heck of a bumpy ride. Well, Donald and I were off and running. Kansas City, where Dean was born, was the first stop in what would amount to 10 years of producing workshops across the country. When we left for California the next day, I sat beside Don on the plane and leaned my head against the cool glass window. There was a huge lump in my throat as I whispered silently, Did I do it, honey? Is that what you wanted? 
I swear to you, I heard him say inside my head, that was it, Mom. You did good. What followed that first undertaking was so unexpected that I completely misunderstood the purpose behind it all. I thought I was meeting people I was supposed to help write screenplays, but they were coming to me in such strange ways that I was confused. And there were so many of them that I panicked. I could tutor them to the point where they had a perfectly formatted, dynamically told screenplay, but I didn't have the magic that would get it made into a movie. Yet on they came, a stream of students from everywhere, some of them riding cross-country in a bus because a bus was all they could afford. They were following their heart, expecting Donald or me to catapult them straight to writer's paradise or at least onto a studio lot. But screenwriting isn't just an art, it's also a craft. Some of it can be learned, and some of it can't. You either have a cinematic sense of dialogue and scenes, or you don't. You can be taught to format. You can be taught to hone your talent. You can be taught marketing techniques. But if you don't have an ear for the way people talk, if you don't see each scene on a mental screen as you write it, then no teacher can help you. There are actors, producers, directors, all kinds of professionals who've been in the film business most of their adult life and still can't get a particular picture made. It took Michael Douglas years to get the classic award-winning One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest produced, and that was after his father Kirk finally gave up trying to do it. It took Barbara Streisand years to put Yentl together, and the same is true of Lily Zanuck's Driving Miss Daisy, even though it had already been a Pulitzer Prize-winning play. Executive producer Anne-Marie Gellin spent four years trying to put fried green tomatoes together, and that was three years after others had made every effort to produce it. It was difficult to make those attending our workshops and seminars understand that before their first script to be sent to Hollywood or Burbank or wherever they were sending it, they had to first comprehend the business of the business of being a screenwriter. Yet I was determined. I would teach and preach until I was all taught out, if need be. When I came home after one of our weekend outings, I'd see that box of Dean's story ideas under my desk, and a wave of resolve would sweep over me. I'd push up my sleeves and begin planning the next workshop somewhere around the country. By heaven, I would do for others what I wish I had done for Dean. It had been said lightly to Donald. It was said in earnest to God. I chose the cities in which we gave our event, well, for mostly personal reasons. For instance, I'd gone to junior high and half year of high school in Texas, so I wanted to give a workshop there just to kind of see how it looked all these years later. Burbank Junior High in Houston, it was one of my best experiences. Well, I had visions of connecting with kids I'd never forgotten from those early years. Johnny Baird, the handsome North Houston movie theater usher, and Barbara Botts and Ray Floyd, Laverne Corliss. I could envision reunions and big hugs and the sharing of memories. But for some reason, I wasn't able to connect with the film commissioner there. I planned to make it a point to always contact the local film commissioner's office before coming to their territory. I'd already decided on a policy of inviting them to speak, or at least be on hand to answer questions from students. Well, I didn't feel the Houston office was intentionally avoiding me, but it was frustrating not to be able to make contact with anyone there. I realize that when I attempt something and I meet only brick walls, that maybe God's telling me to do something else. It isn't always easy to determine when you're supposed to square your shoulders and push on, proving you've got grit and spunk, or when it's time to simply move along to Plan B. After a while, I gave up trying to put a Houston workshop together and decided to set my sights on Austin instead. The fact I chose Austin because I couldn't make it happen in Houston should have been my first clue that something cosmic was up. I thought I selected Austin because I'd never been there and it would be an interesting experience. The truth is, Austin had chosen me. I always say to God when I have a problem and I ask for his direction, hey, God, don't be subtle. You gotta burn a bush or I won't get it. Well, no bush burned and I didn't get it. Not right then, anyway. You've been listening to Dear Dean, Love, Mom, told by its author, Esther Luttrell. 
The theme was composed and performed by David Randa of Feslian Studios. This production was recorded by Dean Fairweather. This is Jeff Evans, inviting you to Soar on the Wings of Imagination. <laughs>